Welcome friends to the Probate Nation, especially new viewers from Delaware, commonly referred to as the First State. My name is Richard Ruddy. You know, Delaware earned the nickname First State because its early leaders moved quickly to sign off on the U.S. Constitution. In fact, one of those leaders, Thomas Rodney, rode 70 miles on horseback through a rainy thunderstorm night on July 1st, 1776. Arriving in Philadelphia in his boots and spurs on July 6th, just as voting on the U.S. Constitution began. His vote proved instrumental in Delaware approving the vote for independence, and then the U.S. Constitution was adopted two days later. Tonight, we will learn the basics of probating a Delaware estate, from where to begin your probate journey, the legal and tax stops you will need to make along the way, and when to deliver the estate to the beneficiaries. We are fortunate to have as our guest Veronica Townsend, an estate and probate attorney. Veronica will share with us the ins and outs of probate law in Delaware. Let me tell you a little bit about Veronica, though, before we get going. Veronica is a proud, lifelong Delawarean whose family roots in the area trace back for many generations. She is a graduate of the University of Delaware and the wonderful school, Elon University School of Law. Veronica is the owner of the Delaware law firm of Weidman and Townsend. A large portion of her practice is focused on estate planning, probate, and estate and trust administration. Her passion is to serve her local community by rendering advice to her clients that achieves their wishes by taking care of loved ones and by being a guiding light for them in difficult times. Please welcome Veronica Townsend. Hi, Veronica. Hi, how are you doing today? Good. Before we jump into the topic, with all of the YouTube videos out there on just about every topic under the sun, so many folks like to do it themselves these days on just about everything. Is Delaware probate something that someone can do on their own, pro se, without an attorney? I've definitely found in, in my experience that many of my clients or even just other individuals in our state that have lost a loved one are comfortable with proceeding with representing themselves and the estate with probate. It helps that our Register of Wills office in my county, which is Sussex County, the staff that work there and the deputies are absolutely incredible. They are so helpful. Our website has a lot of information on it too. So I have found in the past that a lot of people felt that they get their hands held the adequate way with our Register of Will staff. So many people do it on their own. Well, that is great to know because it does, it varies across the country as far as um, what courts are able to, will help and what courts really require lawyers to be involved. But in that regard, let's talk about the, what court actually oversees Delaware probates. Great question. So our state of Delaware, for those of you who do not know, we are a very small state. So we only have three counties in our entire state. My practice is in Sussex County, which is the bottom portion of our state. The Register of Wills Office, there is one in each county in our state. So if you're dealing with that Register of Wills Office, it is county specific. If there's anything that has to be dealt with in court, it is our Chancery Court. Okay. The Chancery is a Delaware specific court. So they handle all these probate cases and estate litigation if there is any litigation required for the estate. Our Chancery Court also handles corporate matters. So just a side note, our state, many do know this, is very corporate friendly. Many of the existing large corporations that exist out there have actually incorporated and formed in Delaware. So a big reason why many of them choose to do it is because we have this Chancery Court that's purely devoted to dealing with corporate matters as well as estate matters. Now are there, and that's good to know, so are there different options available to probate an estate in Delaware? This is as a big picture, we'll get into some of the details in a second. And if so, what are those options? Yes, so there are, but there's really not at the same time. So there's probate with a will, there's probate without a will. There's also something called a small estate and an ancillary estate. And again, we'll touch on all the details with that later. Probate with the will and without it, paperwork wise, it really is very similar, but you're just talking about some different terms for the initial filing of the documents and what the representative of the estate is actually called. Okay. Now, does the existence of a will have any bearing on the probate option to be used in an estate? The existence of a will does not. However, the existence of the will does lead to the ultimate beneficiaries of the estate. So if someone does not have a will in place, then their assets will pass according to the intestacy statute. So that all comes from the Delaware Code, 
particularly Title 12, breaks down all of the various individuals that a loved one will ultimately leave their assets to if they did not have a will in place, then that means their assets pass according to that statute and their assets go to those people pursuant to what the law says. Sure, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but basically for our audience, um, if you don't write a will for yourself that's acceptable and admitted to probate, then every state, including Delaware, has written a will for you. And it can have some really, uh, in some states, and maybe not necessarily, it may not be in your situation, can have some unintended consequences if, uh, if you do not have a written will. Um, Absolutely. So in, in preparing for the show, though, um, you know, we discussed that there are many court forms available online for someone who's so inclined to initiate and probate an estate pro se. Could you share your thoughts on, again, the practical implications of using those do-it-yourself forms? Again, I think in the outset you suggested that's not a bad thing, um, but uh, this, if you want to add a little more to that, is there any reason why folks should have a lawyer involved, even if they have all these available forms? Sure. So although it is a help that our Register of Wills has these forms pretty readily available on their website, and when you do initially meet for your appointment with them to set everything up, they will set you up with all the documents that you need. But I've had so many clients over the years where my office has prepared their will, that person ultimately passes away, and their loved ones feel the most comfortable contacting our office since we're the ones who prepared those documents and we know what their wishes were. Not to mention our area down here in Southern Delaware, for a lot of people, it's still a vacation area and their parents are moving here to retire. Our state is very, very tax friendly. So there's a lot of people that are moving to the area, retire here and ultimately pass away here. So many of their executors are not local. That's typically when I find that they do want our office involved to assist with the paperwork. So they're not the ones that have to keep traveling to Delaware, going to the Register of Wills office and signing all the documents there. We can send them everything just to sign with a notary where they are, and we can take care of e-filing everything for them. I, I will comment that I, I, I was working on a Delaware uh, ancillary probate, uh, and which we have talked a little bit about, um, but it, it, the, the Sussex County Register of Wills office was fabulous, okay? And they just, they sent me everything that I needed to know, and um, you know, if I had any questions, I'd send them an email. They would respond quite quickly. So I was, it was great public service by those those registered Absolutely. wills. Absolutely, just really fantastic. I um, agree. We're, we're, in your experience, we were talking about a will. Now, where do folks typically keep the will that they've signed? Good question. So my preference is that they have a fireproof safe right in their own house. That way, they're in control of it. They have the combination to it. When I prepare the wills for my clients, I do always advise that they make very clear to their executor that they're having this document prepared and where they plan on keeping it and how the heck that person will actually access that safe. Of course. That. <laughs> because that can be the missing link that is not always relayed to those people. So I do still have many clients that utilize safe deposit boxes at the bank. They are not my preference, primarily because they're very challenging for family members to access upon the death of the will maker. So again, we want that person's life and job when they lose their mom, dad, sister, or brother to be as completely simple as possible. So having it right in that safe at the house is definitely the ideal method of storage. I would, I would concur with you about the, the challenges of accessing a safety deposit box. Although here in Virginia, we can certainly do so for the sole purpose, but a lot of times folks don't have the keys. And so, exactly. you know, so now you, you, you can't, you have to get it drilled. And so then now what do you do? You got all this content. So anyway, it is a challenging thing and people need to think through the, the use of a safety deposit box and have that organized in an orderly fashion. Um, if, if we're probating a will though, what is necessary for the will to be admitted to probate? So our register of wills does require the original will. That is a big reason why once these documents are signed, I really urge all my clients to put it in that safe place and to be sure that their executor has the key. Our Register of Wills will not accept a copy and it does need to be that original. In our state of Delaware, what makes a will valid is that it has to be signed in the presence of two witnesses. They also like it to have a self-proving affidavit. So that means those two witnesses are not only watching the will maker sign the will, but a notary watches that person sign as well and watches the witness attest that they saw the will maker sign. That then negates the need for those witnesses to later go back to the Register of Wills office and attest that they actually saw that person sign. 
with the self-proofing affidavit, that notary is saying, yes, I saw this will maker execute the will. And I also saw these witnesses sign as well. So that way, once that person ultimately does pass, there's no question about the validity of the document and about any of the witness requirements whatsoever. So if they don't have that self-proving affidavit, do those witnesses have to actually go to the Register of Will's office to actually sign an affidavit saying they were there? Excellent question. And I'm in the midst of, of dealing with an estate like that right at this moment where it was signed with two witnesses but was not notarized. So in that instance, you either do have to find those two witnesses who have to go to the Register of Will's office and attest to the fact that they did see that will maker sign. That is a big challenge. Uh, Many yes. times you're dealing with a very old will and one of these people or both of these people have passed away. You're trying to track them down. It's a whole mess. Or our Register of Will's will accept an affidavit that's signed in their presence by other individuals that are familiar with that will maker signature, but they cannot be interested parties at all. So that also proves problematic because again, many times we have the children that are the executors, the heirs of everything. So it's a challenge to find someone else that actually can sign that affidavit that's not an interested party. That sounds like a challenge. I think the, the making sure there's a self-proving affidavit is critically important. Um, okay, Same so with, I'm sorry, go ahead. When clients of mine move here from other states, that's another consideration because many surrounding states don't require that self-proving affidavit. So then there's still additional documentation that that executor would have to file if they're submitting, let's say, a Maryland will or Pennsylvania will, or they still have to get proof that's submitted from an attorney who prepared that will to state that it was valid under the laws of that state. Mm -hmm. So still ideal to have your will updated when you move to Delaware, because again, these states have different nuances with what makes a will valid or not. So again, for simplicity, we want to be sure that it has the two witnesses and the notary. Of course. Um if there's no will, um, then how does the state, admission, state administration undertake it at, that, at the courthouse? If there is no will, that estate administrator still has to file our basic opening documents, which is the petition to formally open an estate. They have to submit the death certificate. Because there's no will, there's an affidavit that they have to sign that says that they searched the personal effects of the deceased and they were unable to actually find that will. They also have to get a formal renunciation that is signed by every living relative of the family of the deceased. So that's definitely a challenge. Let's say the deceased had you know, five children. One of them has to formally petition the court to be the executor. So that's a whole decision that has to be made amongst the family and getting the signatures of all the other relatives to formally renounce can be a challenge as well. Wow, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, paperwork involved there. <laughs> Even if there you, is. <laughs> even, if you, even if it's pro se. Now, is the process to probate an intestate will pretty much the same as, a, as probating a, a state that has a will? Correct. The process is still the same. The documents are still identical that are filed along the way. The only difference is on the inventory, which is a document that's filed three months after the estate has been opened. There's always a section for real estate to state that if the deceased had a will, pursuant to their will, the real estate was left to XYZ individual. But if there's not a will, the personal representative would just complete it and say, pursuant to the laws of intestacy, the property was left to the following heirs. Okay. So just a little bit different verbiage that they include in the documents, but the documents themselves are the same. Okay, so let's let's take a look here. Um, we talk about some of the uh, we talked at the beginning about the about two probate options that you outlined at the beginning. So let's talk about the simpler one, which is the small estate affidavit. So when can a small estate affidavit be used to avoid any more complicated probate? Absolutely. So our threshold and really the two triggers in our county for probate is if the deceased owned any interest in real estate and their name individually, or if they owned an interest in real estate as tenant in common, even if it's just a 5% interest, the other is if they own any asset in their individual name that exceeds $30,000. That $30,000 trigger can even be met by combining assets. So let's say the deceased had a bank account, a checking account in particular that had 15,000 in it, and then a savings account that had 20. So that alone would put you over that 30. That's when you have to do a full probate. If you're under that threshold, that is when we can prepare something called a small estate affidavit. That has to be completed by the personal representative after 30 days have passed, once someone has passed away. The idea behind that is 
during that time period, they would know or likely should know if there is a need for a full probate. The register of wills does not someone does not want someone to sign that initially and then come back after they actually have to you know fully probate an estate. Okay. So with that affidavit, you have to wait 30 days. The personal representative would sign off on it and they would state that it's been more than 30 days since the deceased had passed away. All of their assets that they owned in just their individual name were under 30,000 and there's no need for a formal probate. Okay, and I gather there must be a form that actually is available for folks to use to do that. Yes, there's a form. I believe it's on the Register of Wills website and if it's not, you are able to call them and they will send you over one. Okay. Good. With that form, I typically see that it's used for small bank accounts that a deceased person might have just in their individual name with a few thousand dollars in it, but almost always it's used when the deceased owned a car and just their name, because typically you're under that threshold. And in order to transfer that title over to somebody else upon the death of that car owner, that small estate affidavit can be used and presented to DMV so they know that they have the right person signing off on the back of the title to transfer it to another owner. Okay, so um, we go through regular probate. Um, please ex explain for us, if you could, you know, we talked about the, the estates that have, that get bumped into regular probate because they don't qualify for the small estate. Uh, I guess the court that's involved is gonna be the Register of Wills to do most of that work. Correct. Um, and um, so how do we initiate the probate? Do we have to file an inventory? Is there an accounting that's due? Just tell us, if you could, briefly kind of the process. Sure. So in order to formally open an estate, there's a whole packet really of opening documents. So there's the will, if the deceased did have a will, which ideally they did, the death certificate, the petition to open the estate. On the petition, there's basic information. So it's the name of the deceased, where they lived at the time that they died, who the personal representative is. You list the next of kin as well. The executor also has to attest on that form that they've never been convicted of a felony in this particular jurisdiction. There is also the need for a power of attorney. If you have an out-of-state executor, our Register of Wills requires that that executor will allow the Register of Wills office in our county to be issued with service of process if the estate is ever sued for any reason. But again, that's only for out-of-state executors. There's also a basic information sheet that's submitted. That information sheet pretty much covers what's on that petition again of basic information of the deceased what they owned at the time that they died and which family members they left behind. Even if they're not involved in any way, the Register of Wills still likes a breakdown of who those people are. Now, we, so we that's, may, I'm sorry, I'm, pardon me, I didn't mean to. That's okay. So, so, so that's the initial slate of documents. Do you want me to cover the next ones now? Well, hang on. <laughs> I know there's an inventory to be filed, which yes. just gives some detail, and then there's an accounting. And so, um, so these, and these are all forms that are available on the Register of Wills website. I know we're gonna show on screen at least the links, I think, to the Sussex County Register of Wills and all the different forms and, and information documents that they have, just by way of an example to show how um, robust the support is from the Register of Wills. Um, Absolutely. The, you mentioned something though that I thought was interesting. You know, We have the inventory, we're gonna file an accounting, there's some rules for that, but what about this affidavit in lieu of receipts? So that comes towards the very end of the process. So once you get your estate formally opened, three months in, you're required to file your inventory. Okay. That is where you have the responsibility of breaking down any asset the deceased owned just in their individual name at the time that they died. Then towards the end of the estate process, and I'll give some information on the timeline in just a minute, but at the end, you file a document called the accounting. That is where the executor finally gets to break down all of the expenses of the estate, like the funeral home bill, any celebration of life, if the property tax bill came due during that time. With that, you also have to submit a document called the affidavit in lieu of receipts. Oh, okay. Everything that our Register of Wills office handles is all submitted on these affidavits that go directly to them. So as the executor, they have the burden and really the responsibility of keeping documentation that backs up all of the numbers that they've submitted to the Register of Wills. I believe in some other states and other jurisdictions, anything you submit to the Register of Wills office, you have to give them that proof. You have to say, here's what the house appraised for at the time the deceased 
you know, passed away. Here's a statement showing what was in their bank account with Discover once mm -hmm. they passed away. But as the executor, all you do is sign that affidavit in lieu of receipt saying, hey, register of wills, everything I've submitted to you, I have proof that backs all of that up. It's all kept internally with the executor or if they have a probate attorney like me to take care of things for them, we require proof of all of that before we submit it to the register of wills. But our register of wills office does not actually need formal proof when you submit the documents to them. So that's nice. It is. Now, I'm going to switch gears for a second here. So um, we're doing this estate, you know, to work our way through all the bills and kind of settle up anything it's owed by the decedent. And then eventually we're going to uh, need to pass things out to the heirs, okay, or beneficiaries. You know, what is the, the why is the identification of beneficiaries and heirs important? Absolutely. So as the executor, you have a fiduciary duty to the estate. So you need to be sure that you are fulfilling the wishes of the will maker adequately and fully. But that includes ensuring that all of the assets that that person wanted to go to the beneficiaries in the will actually make their way to those people. So it's important when you're completing that petition to have accurate mailing information for those heirs. Primarily, it can be a problem if a deceased does not have a will, because many times then there could be family ties that have been severed over the years or a relationship that went south many years ago, it can be really difficult for the executor to get in touch with those people at that time. So again, just having proper identification is key because you need to be sure that you're doing everything that that will maker intended by setting forth the will to begin with. Now, what is the best way that you've found to locate beneficiaries and heirs at law? Fortunately, I've not run into many issues with this. So I've, I've seen it play out before, especially in the context with some real estate settlements where some heirs can be very difficult to track down. It can really be difficult if those heirs are older, let's say they're in a nursing home or assisted living and they have someone taking care of their affairs as power of attorney. And it can also be challenging if that, be that heir or beneficiary is even underage or freshly 21. It still can be difficult to get in touch with them and to be sure that they receive the documentation that they need to from the executor. Now, um, regardless of how an estate's probated, whether it's an you know, um, whether it's uh, through a, uh, some sort of a small state affidavit or regular, through a regular probate, what are some of the important duties that a personal representative executor has? So this kind of goes in line too with that affidavit in lieu of receipts. You always need to be sure that if you're the executor, you are keeping thorough records and thorough track of everything because everything you're submitting to the register of wills, you need to have the documentation to back that up. But also if the heirs ever question you on anything, you want to have all the documentation as possible as well to back it up and to show to them that every dime that was intended to go to them did in fact make its way to them. Now it's also important if you're an executor that is considering taking a fee for the work that you're doing. So in Delaware, our basic law is any executor that's handling the affairs of the deceased as the executor or personal representative, they're entitled to reasonable compensation. I know that term is, is similar with a lot of many other jurisdictions, but reasonable, what I tell many of my clients, is so vague that it really always comes down to what's a matter of unreasonable and unreasonable means what the other heirs and beneficiaries would actually fight you on as the executor. So if you are choosing to be compensated, I really advise that that person documents everything. If they're reimbursing themselves for miles, if they had to travel here to list the house for sale, that they have a breakdown of everything they ever spent their money on, if they're asking to be reimbursed for it, and just have a, fur, a full documentation of everything that they are you know, requesting to get paid for. Most probates take less than a year in Delaware? The timeline is about a year. So in Delaware, we have a creditor claim period of eight months. So once the estate has formally been opened, the Register of Wills office will run a newspaper notice in the paper. You as the personal representative get to select the newspaper on that petition when you open the estate. The Register of Wills office will run that newspaper notice and the creditors from the time that that estate is, is opened will have eight months to file claims against the estate. So by the time that executor opens the estate with the register of wills, wait the eight month process. After that time, you have the ability to formally file the accounting, affidavit in lieu of receipts and other closing documents. So I tell everyone to at least expect that it will take a year. 
And that's if you have somebody that's really filing everything timely along the way and meeting those deadlines when they need to. Our Register of Wills office, many times since we are a small county, they can get kind of backed up with the appointments to formally sign the documents in house with them. So if you do not have a probate attorney involved, it oftentimes can take longer for you to get on their schedule to sign those closing documents with them. Well, I think we're, we're, we're really, <laughs> there's so much information you're sharing and we're, and we're running out of time. So uh, really briefly, um, how, do we, how do we wrap up on the state? To wrap up the estate, the executor will complete the accounting so they will break down all of the assets that may have come in since filing the inventory. So let's say a new bank account was discovered that the executor did not know about with that three month mark. They'll list it on the accounting. They also will break down any expenses of the estate. That accounting is important to be accurate because our Register of Wills office in Sussex County takes 1.25% of the net estate that's, oh, that's broken right. down right on that accounting. So the numbers really have to be accurate there because before the Register of Wills Office will allow that person to close the estate, they will cash in and collect their fee. Yeah, well, I tell you, this has been very, very informative and we are really, I, I can't even believe it, we're out of time. and I thought we were gonna have plenty of time, but you are so <laughs> informative. Thank you so very, very much. Um, on behalf of the Probate Nation, I really wanna say thank you. I mean, it's just been unbelievable. Thank you for sharing a great overview of the Delaware Probate, you know, your advice as to what to do and what not to do and the pitfalls to avoid all valuable information and really a super great public service to the probate nation viewers. So thank you again for coming in and talking with us. Absolutely, I'm happy to help. You know, without a doubt, probate can be complicated and confusing, but certainly less stressful than the horseback ride of Thomas Rodney to Philadelphia <laughs> in 1776. Veronica has given you an excellent introduction to the Delaware probate process, including steps to take and pitfalls to avoid. As we've learned, there are many probate forms available online to assist you with your Delaware probate journey, but you know, understanding what to file, when to file, and where to file it, and what pitfalls to avoid may not be captured in those forms. So this is where a consult with an experienced probate attorney, at least at the outset, will serve you well. Their guidance will help you avoid unnecessary work, delays in your probate journey, and additional fees and costs. This concludes our show this evening. Just a reminder that replays of the show can be viewed on the Probate Nation website and YouTube channel. And if you want to receive, if you wish to receive a free uh, newsletter, um, Probate Nation newsletter, you're welcome to sign up at probatenationnews.com. Thank you for visiting with us. And again, until next time, I am Richard Ruddy, and this is the Probate Nation.